uh, we have 760 participants who registered. At the moment, uh, we have over 300 participants. We really hope we get up to 700, uh, if not even more than that. And those of you who cannot join, uh, please do join our uh, uh, Facebook page where you can watch this thing live. I will give the link to everyone um, in here. I've also put a link in the waiting room. So those of you who are here and you have friends who are telling you they can't join because they can't get in, uh, please let them know. This is the link to go to and you can watch this live. Um, I think um, uh, Professor Andrew was saying that this is the most number of people he has been in a talk where uh, participants are involved in terms of Zoom. And I think this is um, really a testament to how important this topic is for everyone who is here. Um, this topic is obviously something which is very dear uh, to everyone's heart. Um, SLS, sorry, all of you who are here, um, if you can turn off your videos, besides the speakers, um, and also turn off your uh, uh, um, microphones, if you could please, because uh, it does disrupt a little bit. Um, and later on, what we will do is we'll ask people to uh, unmute themselves um, as well as uh, to, to show themselves. Um, but that's later on when it comes to um, Q&A. Okay, so if those of you are coming on, please do switch yourself off in terms of video and your microphone. Okay, so that we don't get disrupted. Um, okay, so uh, as I was saying just now, uh, um, SLS, basically strives to bring quality talks to uh, everyone on current affairs that matters to our members as well as the public. And it is hoped that today's forum will be just such a talk. Um, when one thinks about Star Wars, uh, you think about Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader, Yoda. And when one thinks about Egypt, uh, we think about the Great Pyramids of Giza. So when we talk about MA63, who do we think about? Immediately, we think about people like uh, uh, Dr. Professor Shad, uh, Professor Andrew Harding, YB Baru Bien, and Professor James Chin. All of these people come to mind. So today, we are very, very fortunate because we have all of these brilliant, brilliant speakers who are under one roof for the very first time. Um, they have done talks themselves individually um, or, or in pairs or whatever, separately in different forums. But this is the very first time that we have gotten all of these speakers together under one roof. And uh, I think um, it is going to be a blockbuster. I call it a blockbuster because it is um, of an event where all of you can share in the thoughts of these uh, very learned people um, who have delved a lot into this part and into thinking about how we can make best of what happened on 15th of December, 2021. Just very, very briefly, um, I won't go into it because everyone else will. Uh, on 15th of December, 2021, basically Article 1, Bracket 2 of the Federal Constitution was amended to essentially um, put back Sabah and Sarawak into one of the uh, partners that form uh, uh, Malaysia. And what does that hold? Is that sufficient? Uh, where do we go from here? All of these are basically talk, um, uh, uh, things that will be addressed today. And it is hoped that from here, we learn about where do we go and what do we do with our future. Um, just a very quick note before I pass this to um, the moderator, Dr. David Fong. Um, unfortunately, Professor Shard is not able to be with us today. He is unfortunately feeling unwell, uh, but don't worry. Um, Dr. David has kindly um, done some desperate measures to learn his slides and he will be presenting uh, Professor Shard's talk. Uh, so you have not missed anything except that you haven't seen Professor Shard. I'm sure he will talk again for us at another time. Uh, but with that, I pass it to uh, Dr. Fung to uh, introduce everybody. Thank you everyone for joining SLS and we look forward to bringing you even more talks. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, yeah, we, we are all eagerly expecting to hear from our 
speakers. Uh, fortunately, uh, Professor Shard could not join us. Our prayers with him and well wishes for him to recover quickly. Now, um, I will introduce the other speakers now. Um, you could see on the screen here, Professor Andrew Harding. And that name is no stranger to all of us because he's written books on the Malaysian constitution. Uh, the latest being the constitution of Malaysia, I think, in hard publication. Um, a very good series of uh, constitutional law books covering all the countries. Now, at the moment, Professor Harding is a visiting research professor at the um, Center for Asian Legal Studies, National University of Singapore. And glad to have you with us, uh, Andrew. Now, um, next, of course, Professor James Chin is speaking to you from Tasmania, right? Okay. So, and um, we all, um, I know it's close to his dinner time, but uh, he will be presenting to you, but this will be from the political side um, of, the, of the MA63. You know? And Professor uh, James is a professor of Asian studies at the University of Tasmania. You would have known him through his writings in the national and local dailies uh, on Malaysian politics, especially when election time is, is here. Now, last but not least, we have YB uh, Barubian from uh, Kuching Sarawak at the moment. Now, um, YB Barubian is no stranger to, to us. He's a well-known public figure. He's, uh, Member of Parliament for Selangan Sarawak, member of the Sarawak State Assembly for Balat, uh, and he is also now a former Minister of Works, the previous uh, uh, government 2018. Now he is a native of uh, Sarawak, a Lumbawang, right, and an advocate and solicitor for the past. 30 years, you would have uh, those who are lawyers would recognize his cases, right? The, the landmark case of uh, uh, No Anak uh, Niawe, Niawe versus Borneo Park Plantation, reported in 2001, is his case, right? He ran the case right up to the federal court, fighting for the uh, native customary rights. So now, um, with all that, I think uh, what we'll do today is this. Right, the speakers will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, about 15 minutes, right? They will cover different perspectives of uh, MA63, the road a ahead, right? all very interesting. Now, they will speak first, uh, one after another, and then when we have finished, that will take us to probably the hour mark, we will have questions and answers. And But so note down what you have in mind uh, when you, you hear them. And, and then uh, we will deal with the many issues actually uh, that we have on this topic. So with this, I shall begin. And I have to say I'm a very poor substitute for Professor Shard, who is the chair of the, I'll get his slides up, um, of the Tungkur Abdul Rahman Chair at the University of Malaya. And we will start with uh, with him because he will lay the foundation for what we have to share today. As you can see here, um, Professor Shah is a uh, emeritus professor to go up to Roman Chair, Faculty of Law, University of Malaya. He has spoken on this uh, many times. And he's going to cover this topic, a step towards redemption or mere symbolism. These slides are prepared by Professor Shah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll start now um, and, and summarize uh, in, in many ways his, his views. Of course, it has, uh, we do welcome the amendments, which as uh, Roger mentioned, 
came through the Constitution Amendment Act, and there are four provisions, right, in this amendment, two of great importance, and at the same time open to great contention. The federal amendment reverts to the constitutional provision of 1963, when the territories of the Federation were described in three separate categories. States of Malaya, the Borneo states of Sabah and Sarawak and Singapore. Though the amendment confers no additional rights or powers, it has significance because it recognizes that Sabah and Sarawak are special and have different autonomous asymmetrical position in the federal setup of Malaysia. The autonomous asymmetrical position was immediately asserted by Sarawak by amending its state constitution to redesignate its chief minister as premier. Now, this poses no legal problems because Article 162 of the federal constitution defines chief minister as the president of the executive council by whatever style known. This is a topic that uh, Professor Shard um, is, uh, is going to deal with now. And that is, we have heard very often uh, spoken in, in the press about the fact that Sabah and Sarawak are now equal partners to the Federation in the peninsula states. But you would know that the amendment no way divides the country into two equal regions, LA states and the Borneo states. It is noteworthy that in some executive, legislative, judicial, and financial areas, Sabah and Sarawak are not equal, but more than equal, and enjoy autonomy and special powers not assigned to the peninsular states. Actually, Professor makes a point that equality will actually be a downgrade because they are actually in these areas given special rights from the point of view of legal personality, there is no separate legal entity called Peninsula States and Borneo States. Sabah and Sarawak and the 11 Penins Peninsula States have their own separate constitutions and along with the three federal territories, each entity has its own juristic personality. However, in some areas, Sabah and Sarawak suffer disadvantages compared to the peninsula states. One, Malaysia's head of state, the Yang Di Petuan Ogong, is by law always from the peninsula. In the king's election and dismissal, the governors of Sabah, Sarawak, Malacca and Penang have no role. Now, in the Devon Rock Rakyat, Sabah and Sarawak have 56 out of 222 members of parliament. West Malaysia has 166 out of 222 MPs. In the Senate, out of 70 members, Sabah and Sarawak has four senators, West Malaysia has 22. Additionally, there are four appointed senators. These are the advantages and the imbalance. Now, now in the annual budget allocation, Sabah and Sarawak do not receive 50% of the allocation. Perhaps they should, due to their large territories and population, but no re law requires that. For example, it's reported that in the 2022 budget, Sabah and Sarawak together received 9.8 billion development allocation compared to the peninsula's 67.8 billion. Therefore, the proper notion of equal partners in Malaya is not based on any law or any historical document. In many areas, Sabah and Sarawak are more than equal. In others, they face serious disadvantages. These are the amendments. The definition of the term of the Federation. Article 162. 62 is amended to redefine the term the Federation to acknowledge both the 1957 and 1963 Federation agreements. You would note immediately that it has taken a very long time, 58 years out of time. 
uh, it specifically mentions the new federation pursuant to MA63 agreement of 1963. Mention of MA63 is most significant because it amounts to incorporation of MA63 into our constitution. Up to now, MA63 was merely an international agreement and thereby not enforceable in local courts. Now is upgraded to constitutional status by our parliament. Along with MA63, the IGC report 1962 is also indirectly constitutionalized, meaning it's been actually expressly stated in the federal constitution. The IGC report has 37 sections and four annexes, and is rich with legal, political, and financial provisions, which must now be taken note of as legal rules. For example, section 26, four of the IGC states about the Supreme Court hearing cases arising from a Borneo state as having Borneo judicial experience. The judge should have it. This IGC prescription was rejected as having no force of law in Kurutum and Director of Forest 2018 and Tia Sandal, Tabal Director of Forest in 2019. These cases will probably need to be reviewed with, with uh, the amendment because now it's expressly stated in the federal constitution. Another provision not fully enforced is the federal constitution's article 112C and the 10th schedule. Part 4, Section 2, Special Grants to Sabah and Sarawak. This particular paragraph of the IGC report calls for the joint appointment of the independent assessor for the purpose. Article 114, Subsection 1, provides for the composition of the Election Commission. There is no requirement that a member should be from Sabah and Sarawak, but Paragraph 25, Subparagraph 1 of the IGC report requires that one member shall be from Sabah and Sarawak. I just pause here very um, uh, quickly to mention that we mentioned the IGC report. This is the Intergovernmental Committee report, which is expressly referred to in MA63 at Article 8. Uh, so that's why it is of uh, quite critical importance. All in all, it appears that the passage of the 2021 amendment, the provisions of AMS 63, the IGC report, and the vocabulary of Borneo states have been now constitutionalized. That is, they're expressly stated in the federal constitution. A new judicial re approach is required for the interpretation of our constitution. The existing provisions must be reinterpreted, maybe, or interpreted as far as possible in harmony with this historical foundational documents. The federal constitution's definition of who is a native of Sarawak in article 161, big letter A, 6, small letter A, and 161A7 is deleted. And the state is rightly allowed now to specify by state law who should be regarded as indigenous to the state. In immediate response to the amendment of the federal constitution, the Sarawak Interpretation Amendment Ordinance of 2022 was amended. These are the amendments. In fact, this is now the, the state matter, the important one. It's, uh, the, it's for Sarawak to determine the list of the 31 races. Now, children of mixed parentage will now be regarded as native, provided at least one is a parent. We move on to now, this, this may be shocking to, to a lot of us, uh, but for the first time now, even though Malaysia has been in existence for more than 50 years, the term Malaysia Day, which occurs in the constitution many times, but is not defined, the amendment now defines in Article 160 of the Interpretation Clause. This is the overview. And this is the question that you, you may be asking yourself. Is this a good first step or it is just mere symbolism? It's just historical, doesn't mean anything, right? This is a Professor Sartre's view. Autonomy and special rights of the Borneo states that contain about 80 or so provisions of the federal constitution and these need to be resurrected and enforced both in letter and spirit. 
the amendment to Article 1.2 is more symbolic and substantial and will not be the magic wand to resolve many woes which need additional measures. However, the Constitutional Amendment Act 2021 is a good first step towards redemption of rights that were repealed or had not been enforced in letter or spirit. The list of litanies, that means uh, unenforced promises or breaches that needs attending is long and painful, and he lists them down here. Finances, there's a discontent about the inequitable sharing of resources, the lack of fiscal federalism. A major complaint is the mega 5% of oil royalties. Another major extremely intricate complaint is that Sabah and Sarawak have not received the mandatory financial allocations that are due to them under Malaysia Agreement 963 and Article 112C and 10 Schedule. These are the provisions and this is what is known uh, to all of us as the 40% entitlement of grant. But despite the abundant natural resources and massive contribution to national coffers, Sabah and Sarawak rank among the poorest states in Malaysia and lag behind in infrastructure, education and employment. Um, Sabah has the lowest GDP of all the states in um, Malaysia, lag, lagging well uh, below the average. And unfortunately, uh, eight out of the, the 10 poorest districts are in Sabah. Now, amendments to the federal constitution. Federalization of critical state matters such as water and tourism have taken place. Article 1211 was amended in 1988 to emasculate the powers of the High Court of Borneo. The power of the governors to appoint judicial commissions was transferred to the Yang Group of Gong in 1994. Federalization of Labuan. Borneoization of administrative serv services is producing, it's proceeding too slowly. Now, uh, the naturalization of thousands of illegal immigrants that has actually destroyed the special rights of Borneo states over immigration and incidentally also citizenship to Malaysia. Islamization, the moves towards an Islamic state. The plan is to introduce Hudu laws. The attempt to export the peninsula's hardline Islamic trend aroused discomfort in Sabah and Sarawak. These are the representation that they want rocket at the moment. Proportion is less than the 33% envisaged in 1963 to give the states protection against amendments regarding two thirds majority. Federal appointments, despite Article 153, Sabah and Sarawak are seriously underrepresented in federal public services. The 20, 18, 20 points for Sabah, 18 points for Sarawak. Many of this have not been honored. Autonomy in matters of religion, language, and immigration have also been weakened. There's now a yearly controversy about the nation's age, should be calculated from 31st August 1957 or 16 September 1963. But I think with the Amendment, there's, there's, there should be no doubt. Huh? Now, this, this is the conclusion of uh, Professor Sharp. He said, as a matter of expediency, as well as a matter of fidelity to the provisions of our 1957 and 1963 constitution, the political leaders of West Malaysia must rebuild bridges of understanding with our brethren across the South China Sea. So this federation can grow stronger. The amendment of the federal constitution gives hope. In a nutshell, his view is that it, it is a significant but important step, first step uh, in the right direction. Now with this, uh, I, will com I complete the sharing of uh, Professor Shard on, on his segment. Now, now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor uh, to introduce Professor Harding, all right? And he will he will be speaking to you from from now on. Professor Harding, over to you. 
Thank you very much, David, and thanks uh, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Let me just um, share my slides here. I hope you can see that all right. Um, since you are kind enough to mention my book, can I just indulge in uh, a small commercial to say that the second edition of my book, The Constitution of Malaysia, a Contextual Analysis, is published on the 19th of May and is already available for advance order on the website of Hart Bloomsbury uh, Publishing. Um, okay, um, so <clears throat> I want to talk about <clears throat> MA63 and decentralization. Um, let me just start by saying that I agree with um, everything that uh, Prof Shad says in his slides. I think the case for greater autonomy for Sabah and Sarawak is, uh, is basically unanswerable. And I want to proceed rather than you know, justifying that position to look at various um, constitutional and legal ways in which this aspiration might be fulfilled in practice. I'm gonna stop short of making any comments about how to strategize claims in this area, because I think the next two speakers, Baru and, and James are very well qualified for more so than myself uh, to uh, address that uh, question of political strategization. Um, so I, I want to run through um, what I see are six ways in which uh, Sabah, Sarawak. Sorry, I've mentioned Sarawak, but every time I do that, I include Sabah because they're in exactly the same position constitutionally. So there are, as I see it, six ways in which greater autonomy uh, could be achieved. And I want to just comment very briefly because I think we're a, a little bit behind time and I think people do want to discuss these issues uh, with regard to some of the consequences and some of the advantages or disadvantages of these various uh, approaches. So um, the first one is uh, simply to rest on existing constitutional guarantees. Uh, as we have seen, um, those are somewhat inadequate and uh, Prof Shad has argued very well uh, how those uh, guarantees and powers ought to be increased. But let's bear in mind that um, under the constitution as it is, um, there's still quite a lot of possibility and room for maneuver. Schedule 9 sets out not just uh, the federal list, which is list 1, but uh, list 2, which is the state list, list 2A, which is sort of supplementary state powers for Sabah and Sarawak, and then a concurrent list. So out of those four lists, three of those lists actually involve giving powers to Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, so a lot more use could be made of the concurrent list, for example, to confer firmer, more powers. Um, Prof Shad has also talked about the special fiscal powers and grants um, that these states are entitled to, uh, for example, under Article 112 uh, of the Constitution and under the, shed the scheduled uh, grants as, uh, as well. So um, th there is a superior fiscal position, but as has also been argued, it's still inadequate because Sabah and Sarawak are still behind the rest of the country in terms of development, despite having um, a, a great deal of natural resources. Now, the, the special positions that have been already outlined to you are supposed to be guaranteed by a power of veto that the state governments enjoy under Article 161E of the Constitution. In other words, any constitutional amendment, let's say um, to the disadvantage of Sabah and Sarawak, um, could be vetoed by the state government, even if uh, it obtains a two thirds majority in the federal legislature. Now, as I see it, that is a very, very inadequate guarantee um, it's to me very odd that this veto power is given to the state government and not to the state legislative assembly. Surely there should be a legislative debate about the exercise of such a veto power rather than giving it to the executive, which may very well be under the domination of, of the dominant party or coalition at the center, as has proved in fact to be the case uh, throughout the period since 1963. So the general idea about um, the division of powers between the federation and the states is that this division should be 
policed by the judiciary, principally by the federal court, of course, uh, it, itself. The record of the judiciary is not terribly strong in supporting the rights, uh, the rights of states um, through litigation. Now, I know there are various um, initiatives in the area of of litigation, but I think we should be cautious about our expectations of of that uh, process. It's not going to answer major questions. It may answer minor or procedural points, uh, but uh, is is not going to be the answer to. Uh, the, the problem of state powers for these states. So the, the practical outcome of all of these positions and guarantees is basically that none of these over 50, 50 odd years now, um, you know, has been um, successful in even maintaining the position that was agreed in 1963, let alone improving on that, on that position. So I think there's a strong case for a rethink about these constitutional provisions and the guarantees that Saban Sarawak uh, have. In particular, what we have seen over the last few decades uh, has been federal manipulation of the state political systems. Uh, and I think that's been a very serious political and constitutional problem. Uh, as those of you from Sarawak will know, this goes all the way back to Stephen Kalong Ninkan's case in the mid 1960s. So the process of manipulation started right at the outset of uh, MA 63 and has basically continued uh, since that time. On the other hand, when you look at the constitution, the definition of these various powers, um, it, it's not really an iron cage. There's a good deal of of flexibility in the arrangement. Um, this is quite complicated for me to explain uh, in a short talk of this kind. But if you look at the articles in the constitution around article uh, uh, 76 and so on, you'll see that we can, we can basically say that despite all the um, uh, definition of powers and so on in the constitution, if the state and the federal government are in agreement on any issue, um, then that can be implemented constitutionally in spite of Schedule 9. So, for example, executive powers can be quite easily delegated to state governments um, just by um, an agreement between between the two governments. So flexible operation of intergovernmental um, relationships um, can bring um, very substantial benefits without any need to amend the constitution as it is. So um, what about seeking fulfillment of the Malaysia agreement? Um, now, uh, as we've seen, this is a kind of a a current aim, as with the constitutional amendment regarding the status of Sabah and Sarawak. And um, let me say here, I agree with Prof Shad's analysis of that, of that. It has been criticized as being purely symbolic and of no practical effect. Um, but I would say that, you know, symbols are actually very important in these matters even if it's purely symbolic. And I think we've already seen that it, it isn't really purely symbolic. Uh, it does have consequences. It also has a great deal of potential in terms of what might follow from the fundamental distinction now reintroduced in the constitution after being previously uh, deleted, um, that that distinction provides a basis for making uh, further claims uh, on the basis of the special position of of the two states. So I think it does provide something like a platform or a foundation to make uh, changes in line with MA63. Um, but litigating these issues, uh, I, I don't think is likely to be terribly effective. I mean, notwithstanding the comments by uh, Professor Shad, there are some areas where it is worthwhile uh, litigating and uh, it may produce some results, but I don't think it can be regarded as a general strategy for resolving this entire problem. So um, political demands generally obviously need assent by the federal government. Um, the point being that uh, other the interests of other states also have to be taken into account, not just those of Sabah and Sarawak, when the federal government makes its calls on 
um, the extent to which demands should be acceded to. And as I'm sure you all know, uh, any constitutional amendment requires two thirds majorities in both houses of the legislature. Uh, and therefore, in order to uh, obtain any relevant constitutional amendments, as with the one that took place in 2021, um, you need to have a broad consensus and broad appeal uh, across the other states, not just uh, Sabah and Sarawak. Now, Prof Shad mentioned the issue of representation, and I want to mention here that um, in addition to representation in the uh, Dewan Rakyat, there's also the issue of representation in the Dewan Nagara. And here there might be scope for change because I think the, the Dewan Nagara is ripe for reform. There have been many ideas floating around about uh, reform of, of that body. And we've seen since 2018, um, you know, just how important it can be. It was not important for many years, but now it clearly is important. And I, I wonder, you know, going back to MA63, if Sabah, Sarawak and, and uh, Malaya, West Malaysia are equal partners in the country, then shouldn't they have equal representation in the Senate? In a federal system, the upper house is supposed to be the guarantee of states' powers. And that was the original idea until the powers of the of the upper house were watered down by the introdu introduction of a vast number, 44 appointed members, which are basically appointed by the federal government. That really um, uh, prevents the upper house from carrying out this role. So I want to suggest, and I know there would be many objections to what I'm suggesting here, but I'm gonna suggest it anyway, um, that with regard to representation, Sabah should have 33%, Sarawak should have 33% and uh, Malaya should have 33% of the membership. That is not proportional to representation, admittedly, but the point is to provide a guarantee that the constitution and ordinary laws will not be made to the disadvantage of those states. And that's quite normal in, in, uh, in federal systems, nothing to get terribly uh, scared of. So, um, all right, what about, um, the other strategy, you may think this is a kind of a contradictory strategy of seeking annulment of the Malaysia agreement. And as you may know, in the last few days, um, a case has been filed in the High Court in, Chu, in Kuching to have the uh, MA63 uh, um, uh, ruled to be invalid because of failure to follow international law and basically to overturn the referendum that was held in, in 19, uh, 1963, about which of course there are many problems which still I think rancor with many people. And in this connection, people have uh, made mention of the Chagos case in the ICJ in 2019, where there's a strong precedent for overturning a flawed referendum, even one that took place a long time uh, in, in the past. Uh, however, I think it would be a mistake to get too worked up about the Chagos case because, again, I don't have time really to go into the minutiae of this, but there are many bases on which the situation of the Chagos Islands and that of Sarawak and Sabah are quite different in this situation. But quite irrespective of that, I want to point out some of the realities involved in this kind of international litigation because the Chagos case took 10 years from beginning to decision by the ICJ. And even now, three years later, the judgment has not been implemented. So, um, you know, 13 years without any practical result, even when you win the case. And I think there are formidable obstacles towards winning such a case if, if this was, were taken forward for Sabah or Sarawak or, or both of them. Um, in the meantime, over all these years, you would be neglecting or even prevented from fulfilling other ways of achieving autonomy. So I, I want to suggest that this is not a terribly good um, way of proceeding. In the current litigation, uh, the idea is to have the MA63 annulled or in the alternative um, fulfilled to its letter, which you may think is a rather strange way to present a case. It's a bit like the wife 
you know, suing the husband for divorce and saying, well, you know, if you won't give me a divorce, at least at least make sure that my husband will be a better husband. I mean, that's uh, that's about uh, uh, the size of the, the the case that is being being pursued. So it, it's very difficult, I, I think, to argue these as alternatives. Are you supporting MA63 or are you trying to have it strike it str uh, struck down? All right. Um, Method number four would be to pursue a general decentralization of powers. And I think there's something in this because Malaysia is actually, um, you may be surprised, one of the most highly centralized states in Asia, in spite of the fact that it's the only uh, federal system, you know, to the east of, uh, of, of India, it's the only federal system in, in East Asia, and yet it is a highly centralized state, and it has become, been becoming even more centralized over the last few years. <clears throat> so um, Malaysia is actually the only state in the region that has centralized in the last couple of decades. And even back in 1957, all that was being given to the states was a measure of autonomy, um, a very modest kind of objective in the 1957 constitution. This has been balanced out, I would say, only by greater political pluralism since 2008, which, which has sort of revitalized powers at the existing at the state um, level. But for Sabah and Sarawak, uh, I'm not sure that a, a general thrust towards decentralization would work because these two, two states are asserting special powers, not powers that are congruent with all the other states. So as Prof Shad said, if you, you know, if you want to uh, claim equality in this process of decentralization, you may finish up actually losing powers rather than uh, gaining them. Or if you do gain powers, you're only gaining powers that the center is willing to give to everybody, not to you in particular. And I think the whole point of the amendment is to say that Sabah and Sarawak are in a different position from the other 11 states. So that marker, I think, should be maintained, uh, as has already been argued. Another problem is that once you start talking about decentralization, it might well introduce the issue of religion, which is a fraught issue in Sabah and Sarawak. So we might be in a situation where um, a debate about decentralization might spur people to demand increased status for Islam in the constitutional system, and perhaps even more centralization of powers over religion. Um, so there, there is that, that problem with decentralization. On the other hand, general decentralization may be very beneficial for a number of other reasons. And note that decentralization involves local government, not just state government. So if you're interested in decentralization, you might want to be interested in how Sabah and Sarawak themselves can decentralize uh, power to local government along with local governments in the in the rest of the country. I think that would be highly beneficial and a necessary ingredient here would be to um, reintroduce local government elections which were abolished as long ago as 1965. Um, now the fifth strategy uh, which is you know part of current st uh, strategy but has actually yielded very little movement so far um, is to um, is to demand special devolved powers. Now, this is irrespective of MA63. You can demand uh, devolved powers that are in, in line with MA63, or you can uh, demand powers going even beyond MA63. Right? Devolution in this sense is one of the advantages is that it's very open-ended. If you look at the example of Scotland, and I think people in Sabah and Sarawak do look at Scotland as an example. Scotland first had devolution 40 years ago. That has not stopped Scotland demanding more and more powers. And in 2015, they were given even way more powers than they had uh, been given at any other previous uh, stage. So, um, Devolution is not something that is simply fulfilled and that's the end of the story. It can, you can continue to make, make demands and adjustments and, and get concessions uh, under a, an open devolution arrangement. You're not bound by 
MA63. You can fulfill MA63, but you can also go beyond MA63. And I think this is a very flexible and very useful um, tool uh, in, in the situation of these two states. Um, and I, I want to make a strong point here because there's a lot of misunderstanding about devolution where people say that, um, you know, you can either have federalism or you can have devolution. This is not actually correct. You can have federalism and you can have devolution at the same time. You can have devolution in support of further federalism in a sort of federalism all the way down system, as one American scholar uh, called it. So it can be used in conjunction with other modes such as the use of existing powers and general constitutional flexibility, which I mentioned, and does not contradict the idea of fulfilling the federal bargain. Also, it doesn't necessarily carry, carry implications for other states, so it's probably politically less complex because you can make demands based on your own particular situation, which may not necessarily be uh, true for uh, other, other states. Uh, as, as the UK has found with Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, for example, you've got three different models of devolved powers. You don't have to give everybody the same powers. All of this may not even need any constitutional amendments or even in some cases, legislative amendment, because to give you an example, of how imaginative one can be. I'm aware that the medium of instruction in the education system in Sarawak, for example, uh, is, uh, you know, is one of the claims that people want to make, that they should have the power to determine the medium of instruction. Now, legally, that can be changed simply by a ministerial order under the Education Act. It's just one of those um, subsidiary uh, orders that is you know, filed in the government gazette. You don't need any legislative amendment, let alone a constitutional amendment, in order to bring that uh, into effect. So I think these kind of loopholes should be exploited and looked at uh, carefully. There are many, many of those. Um, so, uh, but at the end of the day, obviously devolved powers do need cooperation of the federal government, um, as as we've seen. And so far, obviously, in principle, people have said, yes, devolved powers, but in practice, very, very little has actually been uh, been devolved. Even the, the claim with regard to the, the, the royalty on natural resources uh, has not been fulfilled uh, at this point, uh, despite the promises to do so. Finally, and I know some people will be very interested in this possibility, a uh, complete secession from Malaysia, where you would have absolute powers to do anything uh, that you like. Is this possible? Is it desirable? Well, possible, I think the answer is a sort of qualified yes, uh, because after all, Singapore seceded from the Federation in 1965. Um, but note that that uh, case required uh, a, extensive agreements between the Singapore government and the federal government, and separating a territory off after 60 years from um, a federation is going to be an incredibly complex matter. Look how many years it's taken for the UK just to sort out all the issues with regard to leaving the European Union. Even now those issues are not resolved. It's an incredibly complex process. Uh, and it, so you have to engage the agreement of the, of the federation, which is not going to be forthcoming very clearly. Otherwise, you have to do it in a violent way, and that is not going to be in anybody's uh, interest. Uh, it's also going to be a very unpredictable outcome, and I'd have questions about, about the geostrategic or economic vulnerability of these states, and I'm basically not willing to recommend that uh, Sabah Sarawak go down the route of, uh, of demanding um, secession, certainly at this point. So in terms of general assessment, I'm bringing this to an end. I would say uh, it, it use the existing constitutional flexibility to argue for fulfillment of MA 63, the maximization of powers under Schedule 9, experimentation with devolved powers, and if necessary, constitutional amendment, and take a look at the state veto and also the representation in the federal legislature. Um, all of these viable solutions require a degree of what we call cooperative federalism. Federalism is not necessarily a sort of legal standoff 
situation. It actually does require cooperation to work uh, properly. And also, I think we can, sit, can, can think about the watchword of subsidiarity, that decisions should be taken at the lowest possible level, except where that is inconsistent with proper decision making. So if you want to see more about this, I've talked about devolution and subsidiarity in the article on screen. And uh, James and I uh, edited a book, 50 Years of Malaysia Federalism Revisited in 2014. And those may help you to go further with these very interesting, important and complex questions. Um, finally, I think the question should always be not what should be devolved to the states, but what should not be devolved. Everything should be devolved unless there is a strong case for keeping it at the center. That should be the basis of the discussions and the arguments. But I'll just stop there and uh, thanks very much. I hope I didn't go on too long, David. Andrew, thank you. Thank you very much. We, we are uh, um, have to catch up on time a little bit, um, but that was excellent. Thank you very much. I'll just uh, let James have the uh, platform now. James, please uh, proceed. Well, thank you very much, David, and a very good afternoon to all of you and my fellow panelists. I'd like to start off by thanking the Sabah Law Society for their kind invitation to come and spend uh, this afternoon with all of you to talk about MS 63. I'll just start to share my slides with you. <clears throat> okay, so basically what I want to talk about is the political dimension of the constitution amendments that was carried out uh, last year. And what are the, the road ahead? How do we move ahead after the Constitution Amendment? <clears throat> so my short talk will be basically divided into three separate areas. I think it's very important when we talk about MS-63, especially the Constitutional uh, Amendments last year, we need to put it within a certain political context. Uh, we need to understand how we reach the present moment because it will tell us about how we're going to move forward. So in terms of the political context, I think uh, we need to understand recent history and we need to understand that grievances over the Malaysia agreement has been actually been around for a very, very long time. But it only became a political mainstream issue after 2008 general elections. What happened in 2008 was that basically, although Barisan National won power, uh, they found that they did not have enough MPs to stay on in power and they had to rely on the MPs from Sabah and Sarawak. At that time, Sarawak was still under Sarawak Barisan National, and they needed the MPs from both states in order to stay in power. Uh, because of that, uh, very quickly, Najib understood that he has to keep the people in Sabah and Sarawak happy. So Sabah and Sarawak were given additional allocations. And not only that, uh, Sabah and Sarawak uh, politicians were given very high profile posts. So for example, for the first time in Malaysia's political history, uh, the Speaker of the Dewan Raya and both the deputies all came from Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, Najib also made sure that Malaysia Day was gazetted as a public holiday. And he openly said about the historical grievances faced by uh, the Sabah and Sarawak within the Malaysian Federation. This is really, really important because prior to that, uh, the political leaders from Malaya has always sort of downplay uh, what was happening in Sabah and Sarawak. So that was the reason why for a very, very long time, uh, the Malayan political establishment saw Sabah and Sarawak as fixed deposit. In other words, we don't have to worry about what happens in Sabah and Sarawak. They will always vote for the Dutching. Now, this situation became almost unbearable after 2013, when they found that they even relied more on the MPs from Sabah and Sarawak to stay in power. Uh, this meant that they really had to step up and give Sabah and Sarawak politicians even more goodies. Uh, the most extreme example was that if you look at the 2013, uh, sorry, uh, uh, 2008 cabinet, uh, there was only one federal, full federal minister from PBB, the mainstay party in Sarawak. But after 2013, uh, four members from the PBB were appointed as full federal ministers. So you can see, you know, they received a huge reward for helping uh, Najib to stay in power. It was also during this uh, period that the federal government started to actually do something in practice about the MA historical grievances. They set up a federal uh, cabinet level committee to deal with the grievances. And also at the same time, the federal, uh, on, the, on the state side, 
the Sabah government and the Surat government also set up uh, state level committees to deal specifically with the Malaysian agreement issues. Uh, the idea was that these three uh, committees will meet together to sort out some of the key grievances. But of course, we know that uh, the committee never fulfilled its work because what happened was that in 2018, Barisan National uh, lost power to Pakatan Harapan. Uh, this short period when Pakatan Harapan was in power was extremely important in terms of Malaysia agreement. Uh, the reason I said that was because for the very first time since independence, issues relating to Sabah and Sarawak became one of the mainstays of an election manifesto. So if you look at the Pakatan Harapan election manifesto in 2018, you'll find that out of the five pillars, of the election manifesto, one was devoted to Sabah and Sarawak issues, i.e. MS-63. After Pakatan Harapan came to power, the law minister was appointed from Sabah, VK Liu, and he was specifically tasked to resolve the MS-63 issues within two months. So basically, uh, Dr. VK Liu followed the same process as what happened during the Daji administration, but he expanded the number of committees at the federal level. He added two other committees. And all together, 21 issues were brought up. And at the end of Pakatan Harapan's government in 2020, 17 of the issues were resolved. Only four remain unresolved. One of the interesting things about the work of this committee, even though it was tagged as an MS-63 committee, Many of the issues raised in this committee actually were not related directly to the MS-63 uh, agreement. The other thing that Dr. V.K. Liu and the Pakatan government at that time was very keen on doing was that they wanted to change Article 1, Subsection 2 of the Constitution. But they tried in April 2019. It was not successful. Uh, many of the Malayan uh, 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 MPs abstain from the vote, but more importantly, the Sarat GPS also abstained from the vote, and therefore the vote did not go through. My take is that it will have never be, it will have never gotten through, regardless of the petty politics, because within the Pakata Harapan government itself, the Prime Minister Mahathe was actually not in favor of granting more rights or power to Sabah and Sarawak. Mm. Part of the reason is because Mahathe believes strongly that in order to rule a country like Malaysia, to bring progress to Malaysia, you need a strong federal government. So you have an interesting dynamics in the government that while the MPs from Sabah and Sarawak were pushing for Pakatan to fulfill his election manifesto, the prime minister himself was not 100% behind this move to grant Sabah and Sarawak more rights. It's also important to look at the political context within the rise of Gabunan Party Sarawak, GPS, the ruling coalition. You need to understand that GPS support was needed when Pakatan Harapan fell apart and Perikatan National took over in March 2020. In fact, without the support of the 18 MPs on GPS, Muyering Yasin would not have been made the Prime Minister. And because of that, you can see shortly afterwards, Muyading ordered Petronas, which comes under the direct control of the Prime Minister, asked Petronas to settle the sales tax issue with Sarawak. And also he issued an administrative circular calling Sabah and Sarawak Wilaya instead of Negri, instead of states. Now, while this was happening, Perikatan National itself was actually highly divided because within the government itself, the Malayan political establishment was basically divided internally between AMNO and the Satu parties. In the end, this tension led to the overthrow of Muyading last year, but this had no political bearing on GPS and its bargaining power. In fact, I'll argue that with what we're talking about this afternoon, GPS actually became more powerful under the current government because in December last year, GPS won more than a landslide victory. They won 90% of the state elections, state seats in the Sarawak state elections. So this gives them extremely powerful level to use against Kuala Lumpur. Now under this government, MS 63 issues comes under another Sabah minister, Max Onkili, 
but the deputy comes from Sarawak. The cabinet committee now is essentially the same structure we had under the Pakata Harapan government, but more than 21 issues are brought up for discussion. Now, what is extremely sad about the current process is that for whatever reasons, the minister have decided that the entire process must be secret. This is really, in my point of view, unnecessary and unhelpful. For example, the minister even stopped the publication of the Pakata Harapan MS-63 report. This is despite the fact that major portions of the report were already widely circulated among people in the political class. There's really no need to keep this process a secret, but for whatever reasons, the federal government, especially the minister in charge, doesn't want this process to be done in an open and transparent manner. Now, this is the part where I think it's really, really important for the people of Sabah and Surat to understand. In the upcoming general elections, GE15, if Amno and Barisan National were to win a big majority, yeah, two-thirds majority, I can guarantee you the MSCC3 issue will be sidelined again. There is currently no political appetite among the Malay establishment in Malaya for more MS-63 issues, especially anything to do with constitution amendments. For the Malay political establishment, most of them think that the 2021 amendments was enough to satisfy Sabah and Sarawak, and they are not willing to discuss further constitution amendments to grant more rights to Sabah and Sarawak. So the best case scenario going forward is actually for Amno and Barisan to win around 100 to 115 seats only, and for GPS to win around 25 to 27 seats. This means that GPS will have enough leverage after GE15 to push for MSC3 issues. Otherwise, as I mentioned earlier, the MSC3 issues will be sidelined again. Now, what are the immediate consequences of the 2021, 20, uh, the 2021 Constitution Amendments? I think it was a political milestone, politically. This was the first time that the Malayan parties or the Malay establishment in Peninsula Malaysia have actually voted for a Constitution Amendment that only dealt with Sabah and Sarawak issues. Now, although this did not change the mindset about the MS-63 historical grievances, it at least changed the way people living in Malaya look at this issue. It provides a way for people of Sabah and Sarawak to push for this issue and to tell them how serious it is and how this constitution amendment was needed. The other really important thing that came out of the constitution amendment, of course, is that for Sarawakians, who is a native will now be decided by the Sarawak government. Half natives will be considered Bumbutra under the Sarawak constitutions. And of course, given the fact that GPS was the one who brought the constitution amendment, uh, they will have the bragging rights now. And I think this helped them indirectly in the December elections, and it will help them in the upcoming GE15. The other immediate consequences, of course, are highly symbolic. For example, Sarawak changed the title of the chief minister to premier. And it is really to remind the rest of Malaysia that Sarawak is not a normal state in the federation. Sarawak wants to be seen as a founding member, one of three founding members of the federation. Now, you have noticed that since the constitution amendment was passed, Sabah has been much more silent. And this is in part because the ruling parties in Sabah are actually branches of Malayan political parties like AMNO and Bersatu. There's also not a single strong party like PBB in Sabah. So there's a lot less consensus on the issue of MSCC3. And of course, because there's so many parties uh, within the ruling coalition in Sabah, you will find that there's lots of petty rivalry between the different parties in Sabah. So in terms of looking ahead, what is the political wish list? I think the first one is really the budget issue. I think uh, the other two previous speakers have spoke about this. Essentially, Sabah and Sarah are looking for catch-up grants in order to bring more development to Sabah and Sarah so that they can be on par with Peninsula Malaysia. 
in terms of the seats in parliament, I think there was a widespread support in both Sabah and Sarawak to return the situation where Sabah and Sarawak control one third of the seats in the Dewan Rakyat. And I think the previous speaker, Professor Andrew Harding, has addressed the issue of Dewan Negara. I think it's extremely important that the Dewan Negara is split into three separate portions, one for Malaya, one for Sabah, and one for Sarawak. I think in terms of modernization, I think moving forward, they're also looking for autonomy in key appointments. For example, there's always been a lot of unhappiness for a very long time that the state police chiefs are usually appointed directly by Kuala Lumpur, sometimes without any consultation with the respective state governments. This is really important because the state police chiefs are the people who control the fiscal security of the state. Same thing with the Royal Malaysian Armed Forces that are posted to Sabah and Sarawak. Very often, uh, the head in both Sabah and Sarawak, the appointments are not consulted with the state governments. Now, the reason why the reasons why it's very important to consult them is because if you don't consult the state government, you made it very clear that these two persons, the head of the police and the head of the army, they're only answerable to Kuala Lumpur. They don't have to take into account the views of the state government. It's the same thing with universities in Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, the Lembaga, the board is actually appointed directly by the Minister of Education in Kuala Lumpur. So they will be looking at appointing people like the Director of Public Health Education. Right now it's appointed basically by Kuala Lumpur. I think in terms of the state list, what Andrew was talking about, I think there is some movement or there's a lot of interest in adding new items to the state list. Two of the one that is very obvious, and this was not considered back in 1962-63, is of course the issue of tourism and the environment. Increasingly, these two are becoming very, very important. And I think the state governments of Sabah and Surat really want this to be under the state list. Now, earlier on, I mentioned that, you know, under Pakatan Harapan, there was 21 issues. Four of the issues that were outstanding that could not be resolved. And those are issues mostly related to the oil royalty issues, petroleum cash payments, and the Territorial Sea Act, and the rights over the continental shelves. Now, I put it here as a political wish list, but I'm also of the opinion that these four issues cannot be res resolved for the foreseeable future. The reason I said that is because the federal government relies on the money from Petronas for its entire development budget. And therefore, there is no way the federal government is going to give uh, you know, uh, revenues from Petronas back to Sabah and Sarawak. They are probably quite happy to look at increasing the 5%, but it is not possible for them to give oil, uh, oil and gas uh, resources in Sabah and Sarawak back to the states. The issues of IGC, I think this has been addressed uh, by Professor Sharp's presentation in detail, so I will not uh, uh, repeat them here. But there are also some specific issues for the individual states. In Sabah, I think the previous speakers, both speakers spoke about the 40% issue, and of course the PTI issue. The, left, the latest movement is, of course, is that they want to issue a PSS card to the residents. That is also very, very highly controversial. In terms of Sarawak, I think uh, what they want is the federal government to recognize the OMO, the oil, oil mining ordinance. They want uh, the federal government to also to recognize the territorial sea issues, return back to Sarawak. They also want more opportunity in the oil and gas sector. In other words, most of the downstreaming stuff from Petronas, they want it to be moved to the Sarawak National Oil Company called Petros. In terms of the specific, I think the Sarawak government is looking for more appointments at the federal level. For example, the Sarawak government is pushing very hard at the current moment for a Sarawakian or representative of the Sarawak state government to sit on the income tax board and other major statutory bodies. Now, on top of that, this is my personal wish list as we move forward. I think it's really, really important given the fact that we don't really have many legal cases related to MS-63 in the Malaysian judicial system. Uh, we need people to file credible cases. Now, in recent times, there's a lot of excitement over the case uh, filed in Sarawak by people trying to make uh, going to the courts 
to get the Malaysia agreement now and void. Uh, I've actually seen the paperwork and it is my considered opinion that this case is not going anywhere. Uh, there's no way that this case can proceed uh, the way it's currently written. Uh, so therefore, we really need uh, more credible lawyers to step up and file more cases or different aspects of MS-63 in order to get a clear judicial uh, uh, results or clear judicial writings or opinions on sections of the MS-63. I would also like to see uh, the Sabah and Surat Legal Fraternity work together. Right now, they seem to be working independently of each other, even on MS-63 issues. I think over the long run, I would like to see a new model for federal state relations. Uh, the reality is that the, the Malay political establishment in Peninsula Malaysia, uh, their natural instinct is not to grant Sabah and Surat real autonomy. Uh, they still remember the bad, uh, the bad or the bitter feelings they had over uh, Singapore leaving the Malaysian Federation. So there's a great fear that if they provide or if they give more autonomy to Sabah and Sarawak, eventually this will lead to Sabah and Sarawak succeeding from the Malaysian Federation. Now, in terms of decentralization, I think Andrew has really, uh, Professor Hardin has, has really uh, addressed that issue in detail, so I don't need to go through. But the point I'm trying to make is that we really need a new model for federal state relations in Malaysia. Because without this new model, I think the same sort of issues that we're facing now will also come up in the future. The other point I always made is that I think we need more public education on what MS-63 and what is not. If you were to go out there on social media or on the internet, you find that there are tons and tons of materials written about MS-63, but a lot of them are actually nothing to do with MS-63, and a lot of them are actually not true. So I think we need more proper public education on what this is really about, how the Federation came about, and what MS-63 is and what it is not. Finally, I think it's very important that we change the narrative in this country over the long run. The Federation of Malaysia is not about Malaya, nor is it about a Malay Islamic state. I think we need to change the narrative in the long run. Otherwise, we will also, we will come back to the same issues about Sabah and Sarawak being special states in the Federation again and again. So quickly in summary, I think the 2021 Constitution Amendment is a historic moment, but at the present moment, it is large, still largely symbolic. Real autonomy is always in the details, and the key question that we still have to answer is the level of political integration in Malaysia. Because for the past 50 years, it is quite clear that the Malayan political establishment has been trying to push their style of politics in Sabah and Sarawak. They have been partially successful in Sabah by allowing mass migration and increasing the Muslim population in Sabah, but they've not been very, very successful in Sarawak. So because of that, Sarawak is taking the lead, really, in trying to put Sabah and Sarawak's position back at the proper place in the Federation. But unfortunately, Sabah politics is unstable, and the leaders in Sabah are really unable to create a state-based block in order to support the Sarawak position. My argument has always been the fight for autonomy is really a journey. And in the Malaysian context, I'll argue that it is a very, very long journey and we may never reach there. But the important point is, I think the future of the Federation really depends on the Malay establishment in Malaya. Whether we like it or not, the overwhelming majority of the population, the political class, all of them are based in Malaya. If they are strong, the Malay political establishment is strong and united and can control the federal government without Sabah and Sarawak, then obviously there is no political will to deal with any issues arising from Sabah and Sarawak, even non-MS-63 issues. And therefore, to summarize, it is crucial that Sabah and Sarawak get one third of the seats in the Malaysian parliament and one third or two thirds of the bloc in Dewan Negara. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. That's uh, really enlightening on the politics, especially going on to the GE15. Now, um, I'm going to pass the time right now to YB Barobia and uh, 
you, you can share now, uh, YB. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fung, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Sabah Law Society, for inviting me to be part of this uh, very high-powered uh, panels. Uh, you all notice that I'm the only one that is not a professor here. Uh, I think uh, the three uh, earlier speakers had covered most of the things that we all want to hear. But I'd just like to uh, start uh, here uh, with the uh, a quotation from the speech of uh, the first Prime Minister in Parliament on the 20th of April 1962, where he said, and I quote him, when the Borneo territories became part of Malaysia, they will cease to be a colony of Britain and they will not be a colony of Malaya. I thought I made it clear they will be partners of equal status, unquote. I think that's the uh, uh, crucial question we are asking uh, at this uh, 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 webinar this afternoon. What does it mean when uh, uh, they say that we are equal partners, in particular for Sabahans and Sarawakians? Yeah? And what does it mean when uh, uh, the Article uh, 1, Clause 2 of the Federal Constitution had been restored in uh, our recent uh, amendment in Parliament. Now, I uh, propose to just respond to this uh, from basically the political and the administrative uh, perspective, uh, secondly, from the economic and social, and thirdly, just to point out one or two very crucial points under the MSEC3. I'll be uh, mostly sharing uh, with you on, uh, on statistics and facts, uh, which perhaps would uh, uh, support and affirm what the other three uh, speakers had uh, said uh, with us earlier on. On the first point on the uh, uh, aspect of the one-third seated parliament, uh, I think we all know that uh, uh, this uh, had been watered down after Singapore left Malaysia in 1965, and uh, uh, which has uh, uh, really uh, uh, gone down for the combined number for Sabah Sarawak to, at the moment, about 25%. Now, uh, interestingly, at this uh, session of parliament, many of the YBs from Sabah and Sarawak uh, uh, mentioned this publicly now, and uh, they're talking about this. And uh, I, I also mentioned this in my speech, and I said that, uh, in fact, this would be the best time. And I agree with uh, Pro uh, Professor James uh, Leo that, uh, uh, I mean, if uh, Abno Bien uh, were to win two-third majority in the coming G15, I don't think MSCT will be discussed and will be sidelined. And, and, and I said in my speech that this is the best time uh, because the uh, uh, YBs from Sabah and Sarawak uh, uh, are the ones that uh, uh, put the PN back in Putrajaya. And in addition to that, I think the law minister uh, that we have is in fact from uh, Sarawak. And uh, secondly, I do agree too, uh, on the appointment of senators, uh, uh, the, the, the principle of one third uh, should at least be applicable to the senators as well. And, and we noticed that uh, for Sabah and Sarawak, we uh, have only the, uh, the, the, the legal uh, uh, requirement of uh, four. And we uh, hear of uh, what uh, Professor Sad had said, there are 44 appointments. And I think this uh, uh, need to be, to be changed. Now, in terms of uh, the appointments of uh, top post in the federal government uh, and institution or agencies department, I'd just like to say a few, uh, which uh, uh, is the reality. Uh, the appointment of ambassadors, for example, you know, um, uh, we should, uh, if you talk about equal partners, yeah, uh, for the moment, uh, the Malaysian embassies has 80 embassies worldwide. Uh, we have only eight ambassadors and High Commissioners from Sabah and Sarawak. Sabah has three, and uh, Sarawak has five. And uh, another example, uh, we talk about the judiciary. Uh, we look at the judiciary. Federal court, we have 11 total uh, uh, judges and justices we have. Sarawak, we have only three. Sabah, zero, uh, comprises of 20% of the total uh, uh, justices we have. Court of Appeal, we have 27 uh, justices or judges. Uh, we have two from Sarawak, one from Sabah. Uh, total, 11.1%. High court judges, we have 49 for the moment. Sarawak has two and Sabah has four. Total, 12%. And the JCs, we have 56. Four from Sarawak, 
and four from Sabah. Total 14% of the total. And uh, I would agree with the proposed uh, uh, proposal too. I think uh, Professor Saad had mentioned earlier on that the power for the appointment of the JCs had been taken away from the governors you know, for Sabah and Sarawak to the Agong, and I would propose that that should be given back to the governors of Sabah and Sarawak. Now, uh, we have the, the, uh, the, the, the others too, uh, top, uh, for example, the army, the police, and the navy. This would be very interesting. The armed forces for the last uh, 50 over years in CC3, we have 19 armed forces. Only one came from Sarawak, none from Sabah ever. And uh, the uh, Air Force chief uh, is the same person that was appointed as armed forces. Now is the Air Force chief for Malaysia. And is the same person from Sarawak. And uh, uh, we have 17 uh, since 63. That's the only one from Sabah and Sarawak. Sabah against zero. Um, Army chief since 63, 26. Never even one from Sabah or Sarawak. IGPs, 13 since 1963. None from Sabah or Sarawak ever. So um, uh, I'm quite certain those lower rank, uh, lower than all these chiefs, uh, would probably in all... Uh, uh, probability would be uh, biased in favor of Malaya as well. So that's the statistic that we have so far. Uh, what about head of department in the federal government? Now uh, the statistics uh, shows that in uh, Sarawak, for example, this is uh, pertaining to the uh, burdenization that had been agreed upon where in fact uh, it was agreed uh, under MSCC3 that all the head departments uh, of the federal government uh, department in Sabah Sarawak should be headed by a Sabahan or a Sarawakian. Uh, for the moment, we have 103 positions in Sarawak. Uh, only 64 are held by Sarawakians, uh, three Sabahans, and 36 are still by West Malaysian. Now, uh, on the federal service uh, aspect of it, uh, we just look at grade 54 uh, above, uh, interestingly. Sabahans uh, consist of only 2.88% and Sarawakians 4.01%. Now, uh, 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 there's, there's a, a huge disparity in that sense. Uh, where is that, uh, of course, equal partnership in that aspect of it? Now we look at the public universities and uh, uh, institution of higher learning. I think we all know that we have only one university in Sabah and one public university in Sarawak. Um, then what about uh, the rotation of the king? Uh, can this be extended to Sabah and Sarawak as well? I think uh, we never thought of that, but I think if you talk about equal partners, I, I think we should uh, uh, even demand for that rights as well. From the uh, economic and social perspective, uh, we always remember uh, Tunku's statement uh, uh, much earlier, even before forming Malaysia, when he said that, and I quote him, that one of the principal objectives was to further the economic development of the Bono territories so that their standards of living and technical skills might be raised in a firm basis provided for accelerated economic growth so that the gap between a relatively backward state and the advance would be narrowed and not widened, unquote. Now we are uh, in fact at the 12th Malaysian plan and the F prime minister admitted uh, to the fact that uh, there is this development imbalances between East and West. And um, I, I, I believe uh, we're looking at what is going on. Sabah and Sarawak probably are 20 years behind West Malaysia in terms of economic development. Now we look at the 12th uh, Malaysian Plan report uh, in uh, 2019. The incidence of absolute poverty in Sarawak was 9%, which was above the national level of 5.6%. And uh, in fact, in my speech in Parliament uh, last year in September, I propose then that in order to help lift the rural population out of poverty and increase their living standard, we need to provide them with good infrastructure, 
including roads, water, electricity, internet uh, coverage, healthcare, and solid education. And in fact, if you look at Sarawak, it's very, it's appalling uh, that to, to discover that only 13.4% of the rural, uh, rural population had tertiary education. And uh, there are many factors that contribute to this, like long distance to school, lack of good roads and, tra and transportation, poor schooling facilities. Instead, government, uh, in fact, identified that there are 1,020 dilapidated schools in Sarawak. We have the shortage of 3,385 teachers uh, as of July 2021. Uh, lacking of internet, laptop, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now that we are uh, teaching is made online. And even when we look at the G GDP per capita of Sarawak is, uh, in fact, uh, 46,000, 46,000, uh, and uh, uh, considered to be um, uh, second to that of the central region of West Malaysia, which is 62,000. Uh, and yet Sarawak is the third poorest state. Obviously, there is a, this is unfair uh, distribution of the state wealth. So I believe with, with uh, good road connectivity, economic activity, uh, uh, good road, uh, good act uh, connectivity, I believe uh, economic activity will follow. And coupled with better education and healthcare, the opportunity for our rural people to improve their, uh, their lives will be brighter. Uh, I'm sure that is true of Sabah as well. So for this reason, and in the light of this topic that we are discussing, I would uh, in fact propose that Sabah and Sarawak should be given back full powers over the flowings. One, infrastructure, two, education, three, health issue, and fourth, the issue on uh, the uh, citizenship and, and, and part and parcel of the power of the home ministry should begin be given back to Sabah and Sarawak. And we all know that the stateless uh, children issue is now a, a big issue for Sabah and Sarawak. And even in this uh, parliament sitting, it has been raised uh, by a lot of uh, 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 YBs from uh, East and West. Um, so uh, uh, in, in, in line with this too, of course, uh, the, the, the thing that, that, that needs to be done, then if this is given or devolved to Sabah and Sarawak, then of course we should be given the rights to collect uh, taxes in, 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 in regards to this, this area. And uh, uh, I think it would be equivalent to the, the budget or the taxes that have been allocated uh, to these uh, headings uh, 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 in, in the past or in our annual budget. And uh, that should be uh, how it should be to me be implemented if we need to. Uh, of course, uh, the other aspect that we can uh, utilize and uh, exploit here would be uh, that had been raised by Professor Shad on the special grant under Article 112C uh, for Sabah and Sarawak. And uh, we, we noticed that, uh, in fact, uh, the 16 million allocated to Sarawak since 1969 had never been uh, reviewed for Sarawak. And uh, in fact, uh, the PH government had planned to increase that to 32 million uh, and uh, double it in 2022. But unfortunately, that uh, uh, that was not uh, uh, be the case. Uh, and we hear of this uh, uh, Sabah status. I think uh, Dr. Maximus Omkili uh, stated in the paper uh, in February 18 this year that uh, for Sabah, there is a review. Uh, in fact, they were the thinking of uh, a five time increase in Sabah. So that would be one of the areas and the, the means of how Sabah Sarawak should be uh, given that uh, uh, privilege or leverage. Uh, we look at the uh, annual budget itself, and I think this had been raised also uh, in uh, Professor Shad uh, 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 sharing earlier on. In fact, the uh, national development expenditure uh, for, 20, for the 12 medicine plan is 75.6 billion. Uh, and and, and uh, it was promised that Sabah and Sarawak should receive 15% of this, uh, which should be around 11.34 uh, billion. But sadly, uh, as the, I think correctly stated in Professor Shad, uh, uh, sharing earlier on it only uh, 9.8 billion. 
uh, 4.6 billion for Sarawak, which is equivalent to 6%, 5.2 billion for Sabah, equivalent to 6.8%. Shouldn't we get on a 30% at least, if not half? Lah? Yeah, so that is uh, uh, how I think um, uh, unequal it is there. Um, so uh, uh, that is very obvious to me. And uh, I think the next uh, point that uh, had been also uh, raised up and, and shared, emphasized by the three other speakers, I think is on the peculiar status of Sabah Sarawak in terms of one is the issue of freedom of religion. I think that must be maintained, be emphasized. Uh, Sarawak in particular, uh, until now, maintain the fact that uh, it has no official religion, although Sabah had. Uh, uh, changed the status 1975 or 76, I think. That um, the second is the language issue where English had always been used, and uh, until now, I believe that Sarawak, as far as I know, we have not uh, passed any uh, law in the uh, assembly to uh, uh, change that status. Uh, and finally, I think uh, uh, Professor James uh, and also uh, all the I think uh, Professor Andrew and uh, Professor Sad also mentioned about the Turtle Sea Act and the Petroleum Development uh, Act. I think uh, these, are, uh, these two uh, uh, legislation is very obvious and constitutional to me. And, um, and the issue of uh, rights over uh, our petroleum, uh, oil and gas in our uh, uh, waters, turtle waters and continental surf is a big uh, issue. And I think uh, this is one of the areas where the legal uh, uh, fraternity would uh, probably be interested in taking in. I know that the state of Sarawak had uh, filed a case earlier on. I think uh, something to do with the uh, challenging of the Petroleum Development Act, but uh, finally it was settled halfway and uh, we're supposed to receive uh, some kind of uh, uh, compensation uh, on, on that settlement. So question, of course, is when, uh, whether uh, this can be implemented. Will there be any change in the coming uh, uh, years after that amendment? I totally agree with uh, Professor James. If AMNO BN were to win in G15 with two-third majority, MSCT would be said line. And uh, I don't think they're interested in this. That's why I very believe that uh, this would be the best time for the uh, people, uh, the, the uh, people, the university from Sabah and Sarawak uh, demand that this be implemented because they are, in fact, the kingmaker as far as the federal government now is concerned. So I'll just leave it there, uh, uh, Dr. Fung, and uh, I think uh, we'll give uh, more time for people to uh, respond to this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... YB European. I think uh, with all that, of course, our time, uh, we have um, taken, uh, overstretched our time already. But with the, with the uh, uh, liberty of all our audience, um, I think uh, you're still all here. Uh, there are many questions that have come in, but let me just perhaps just um, summarize uh, one or two, and then I, I, I would just pose it to the panelists. I think this this whole thing about devolutions have come in. There's questions on uh, even more uh, liberty in the immigration matters in uh, Sabah and, and, and Sarawak. I think devolution, the speakers, you all have agreed that it's, it's, it's something that has to be done and it is a, is a piecemeal matter, right? All right. Can I just direct this question firstly, Wandavi, to, to Andrew, right? You have mentioned that it, it, it's true cooperation, but how in practical terms, uh, after James had mentioned about the reality of the politics, right? That if, if they have two thirds, they would not be interested, you know? I mean, there's, there's, there's no will, all right? I mean, so how, how, do we, how do we move it on from, from here on? Could, could you uh, answer that? Well, I, th I think that's really a, a political question. Um, and I think James is, is quite right about that. What, is, what really puzzles me about this situation uh, is that we're in a unique space 
since 2018, where the members from Sabah and Sarawak have actually held the balance of power. And in theory, they ought to be able to extract, um, you know, um, uh, concessions uh, from from either coalition. I mean, they have, you know, when you're the king maker, you're in a very strong position to make those demands. And there is a danger that this unique situation may suddenly disappear later later in the year. Although I think a two thirds majority is still a pretty big hike for. Uh, for even uh, the BN uh, to make in, in the present political circumstances. So, um, so unfortunately, it looks as though this opportunity is kind of uh, slipping away. And once it does, it's going to be a long time uh, before, before it comes back. Um, I wish there were a more positive answer to give. But thank you, Andrew. James, can you respond to this? This, this, this seems to be a window of, of opportunity right now where we are, right? What are some of the uh, more concrete steps that can be taken now? Well, I think the key concrete thing that uh, people in Sabah and Sarawak are really looking for is the resolve the issue about who actually owns the oil and gas resources, because ultimately that really leads to the money issue. Uh, but as I mentioned in my short uh, presentation just now, uh, there is no way the federal government can give the money to Sabah and Sarawak. First, they don't have it. Secondly, they need the Petronas money for the development portion of their budget. So without Petronas, there is no development for the rest of the layer. So there's no way they're going to negotiate that. The only thing that they can move forward on is that, you know, Sabah and Sarawak will have to get some sort of guarantees from the government, whoever comes in after uh, the middle of this year, that this issue, MS 63 will still be on top of the political agenda. Uh, the way it was in cabinet, and I think uh, YB Baru can can can, can uh, enlighten us a bit more, is that uh, right now uh, the ministers from Sabah and Sarawak are overrepresented. But the problem with the way the cabinet was is that it really depends on how willing you are to speak out and push for it, and whether you're united on the cabinet table. Uh, of course, I'm not a member of cabinet; I've never been there. But it is my understanding the present cabinet. I'm talking about the present cabinet, huh? Uh, most of the uh, Sabah and Sarawak ministers uh, are not that united on certain issues. Uh, but I'm saying that on this issue, perhaps they can actually force the federal government uh, to, to get something in writing. Because a lot of things, as Professor Andrew has mentioned, a lot of things can actually be done through administrative edicts rather than constitutional change. So things like education, right? I'm sure a lot of the people watching this knows that the Sarawak government, a government itself is actually getting involved in private education because they're building six international schools uh, you know, to provide English a medium education. So it is possible to do a lot of things. Uh, but the bigger problem is, as I also mentioned in my presentation, there doesn't seem to be any unity between the politicians in Sabah and Sarawak. I mean, on paper, both Sabah and Sarawak are actually facing the same issue. But when it comes to get things done, right, the Sabah politicians are doing their own thing, the Sarawak politicians are doing their own thing. So to me, right, a lot of them are actually caught up in petty politics. And as long as you don't have a clear unity between the politicians of Sabah and Sarawak, you leave room to be exploited by the Malayan political class. And that's what they've been doing, especially with Sabah politicians since the 1980s. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, uh, Baro, you see, you see since, since we, you have the amendment now, okay, you mentioned that, that we, we agree that this is just not merely symbolic. It's an important step that you have taken on, right? Now, now that, that at least placed Sabah and Sarawak uh, on a different basis, even if you're talking about devolution. Let's take for education now, right? There's a question on how, how do you get the the um, history of MA63 is to be a compulsory subject for, for education, to get it onto the syllabus so that, so that this part of the, the, the uh, nature of our nation uh, is, is, is actually uh, not just an administrative act, but something that's there for the whole country. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with uh, uh, Professor Andrew earlier on. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this can be done by administrative uh, uh, directive. Um, we know that education is in the in, in federal list, 
and that's a problem. Now, uh, bottom, uh, fundamental to all this, I think, is uh, the political will and the uh, understanding and, 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 and I think the pressure and, and uh, uh, the, the unity from Sabah and Sarawak to deal with this, uh, which uh, uh, Professor Jem said, uh, in the cabinet itself. I mean, if you can be united, uh, in fact, as I've said, this is the best opportunity, the best time for uh, the Sabahan and Sarawakians uh, uh, in cabinet to make that, uh, that stand. Uh, I, I can uh, uh, see any other time that will be, you know, you can implement this. So that can be done that, that, that way. Unless, of course, there will be a, 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 an amendment, an agreement uh, that that will be pushed to the stat list. Uh, that, that is how it should be done, uh, as I see it. Uh, yeah. Now, apart, apart from just at, at the cab cabinet level, right, um, since we have the amendment already, right, how, how do you build on it for, on the law? I think uh, Andrew has mentioned that legal cases are um, probably not the way to go. But let's take the case in Sarawak now, right? Because, because if, if the rights of Sabah and Sarawak are ignored all the time, Basically, if you take the analogy that Andrew gave about, about a marriage, you either you stay there and, and there must be some, there must be the, the, the fairness in that relationship, or we might as well call it a day, separation. How, how, how does that add into this mix now, which we're in? I'm talking about the recent, recent Sarawak uh, court case. How does this assist you in this equation? Uh, uh, Professor Fong, I, I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm very attracted to what Professor Shad uh, mentioned uh, in his uh, uh, slide, where he said that the IGC and MACT had now been constitutionalized. Yes. That's very interesting. Now, uh, I, the, the, the case that he referred to uh, among the uh, Kuruntum and Perumasanda, that happens to be my case, the Twitter of yes. Santa, where we argued uh, that uh, uh, the panel for, uh, in the Court of Appeal, at the Court of Appeal and the Federal, uh, 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 if there's any case that comes from Sabah Sarawak, at least there will be a, 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 a judge from Sabah and Sarawak uh, to hear that. And when we argued that out in Twitter of Santa, that was not, uh, uh, as uh, Professor Shad put it out, uh, not the legal requirement, but now, with this amendment, it appears that it has been uh, constitutionalized in a sense, uh, legalized in a sense. So maybe we can take that from that uh, aspect, uh, looking at the IGC and all the the, the, the discussion and the minutes of uh, uh, in the reports that we can uh, uh, piece together to support any legal uh, uh, challenge now. And that's how I look at it. And that includes uh, the uh, uh, Turtle DC Act and uh, the uh, PDA 1974. Yes, just just the questions is asked also. You see, it's, you see, James, uh, in litigation, uh, if those matters are take out uh, one each case at a time, you know, because because it's a, if you just take the significance of this moment, M sixty three has been constitutionalized. It's an agreement, right? It's agreement is meant to be uh, performed, isn't it? Right. So if if the rights uh, of uh, Sabah and Sarah have been ignored for so long, right? You either perform it or otherwise uh, it's, it's a matter of uh, we move on from here because that will that would feed onto the political scene isn't it because uh, that's that's it's an alternative you perform it or, or not you look for separation what do you have to say to that James I think the way to look at this issue is that the thing about MS63 with this sort of agreement right it is not purely legal, it is not purely political, it's a bit of both. But in the Malaysian context, at the end of the day, a permanent solution has to be a political solution. There is no, no way out of this. You can sue left and right and do whatever you want, and you will get, uh, what do you call it, uh, you, you get a legal answer to certain parts of it. The point I was trying to make in my presentation was that the current suit that you're talking about, the one that's happening in Kuching now, I've actually seen the paperwork and I can tell you that that suit will fail. It will not, it will, it will not even pass the initial stage. Uh, what is more likely to pass is you file a suit that deals with 
individual parts of MS-63 because one of the problems we face as a lawyer, you know this, is that a lot of people have tried, but they could not, uh, they could not overcome the local standing argument. So unless you get, get past the argument, I think it will be uh, very difficult. But there are certain things that you need to do at the same time. For example, in the judicial appointments and all the key personnel that uh, YB Baru was talking about, you need to put all those people in place first. And you really need to look at MS-63 as a long-term thing that over the long run, you need some sort of a new federal state relationship. Because basically, the system that was set up in 1963 is not fit for purpose anymore in the 21st century. So if you look at it from that perspective, you can understand where I'm coming from. That at the end of the day, this is a political issue. Although there are legal implications, at the end of the day, it is a political issue. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Andrew, anything you want to say to this? I, I, I mean, only that I agree complete with, completely with James. I mean, the, the legal strategy is only going to deal with rather rather narrow issues and maybe some issues of, of principle, but it's not going to solve the total question. I mean, uh, I think that was the thrust of my entire presentation is that uh, at the end of the day, you have to have political agreement. And, and I think a lot of this litigation is not so much to win the case and the legality of it. It's just used as a strategy to sort of publicize a, a, a political position. It's a kind of posturing, posturizing, and I, I think, you know, that this has become a very common thing in Malaysia over the last twenty years. That nobody takes takes your word seriously unless unless you have a writ behind it, you know. And then you find after a while that, uh, you know, you never hear anything more about that writ. The case never gets to court, or if it does get to court, it's thrown out very, very quickly. Um, so um, I, I share. James's skepticism about litigation as a strategy within limits in certain areas for certain purposes affecting individual rights, um, you know, quite, quite possibly. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think it should be really used as a kind of um, uh, publicity stunt. Yes, I, I just want to, uh, if Professor uh, Shard is uh, anywhere um, uh, in, in this, um, if he has any uh, comments to make on, on our discussion, uh, he's most welcome to, to just um, speak to us. So I think uh, with that, uh, we're coming, coming to five o'clock already. Uh, I think what is the way ahead is some cooperation between the state and federal, but of course the stronger position of uh, Sabah and Sarawak at the moment, the representations. So this matter will be all the committees, uh, like James, you mentioned the 17 points uh, uh, issues have already been agreed for, for it to move forward. The litigation piecemeal would be important, right? Because it, uh, deals with specific issues and, and is also something that the state and federal government themselves will, will look at, right? As for the local standard point, uh, I, I think our, the position has been strengthened. The fact that MA63 now is now expressly mentioned, I think uh, YB Barobian has mentioned that, even in the cases that, that, that we are on a stronger footing in that sense. I, I think we, we were agreed on that. So I, I, I think that uh, maybe we can end this on a not necessarily negative note, right? It's positive. Right? The way ahead is actually positive with uh, challenges, impediments, but with trepidation, I think we, we can take it forward that way. You know? So that is not a bad way to start 2022. Uh, and with that, I think uh, I want to thank uh, all of you. Thank you very much for participating and all the slides. Uh, this is under recording. Those who couldn't join will uh, be asking for the recording. 
and uh, I've certainly enjoyed it. I've learned a lot from all of you, and can uh, well. Thank you very much, and for all the audience who are with us, if you can join me in uh, thanking our uh, esteemed um, uh, speakers, including Professor Shah, who's not with you, but you've seen his thoughts in in the slides. So, so with that, that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor James Chin from Tasmania, Professor Andrew Harding, you're in Malaysia at the moment, yeah, and Boy B. Barovian and Professor Shah and uh, for the Sabah Law uh, Society, we, uh, your enthusiasm for this uh, forum have encouraged us and we hope to continue with this, all right? So have a good weekend, all right? Bye-bye, um, everyone. Thank you, David. Bye -bye. Good. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you, speakers and Sabah Law Society. Dr. David Fung, thank you. Thank you, everybody.